Greetings and welcome to Conversations at Noon on the Connecticut Freedom Trial. I'm Tammy Denise. In 1995, the Connecticut Freedom Trial was established to um, celebrate and designate sites to embody the struggle of freedom for the Black and African community, as well as celebrate their accomplishments. Today, we will be joined by distinguished author Marcus Redeker. But before we do that, please um, look at our survey, fill it out, let us know if you want to hear or see of any other content, as well as join us on different platforms and leave your questions for Marcus after um, he presents his presentation. Marcus Redeker is a distinguished professor of Atlantic history at the University of Pittsburgh. His histories from below have won numerous awards, including the George Washington Book Prize, and have been translated into 18 languages worldwide. He is the author of The Slave Ship, A Human History, published in 2007, and the author of The Amistad Rebellion, published in 2012, which was the basis for his documentary film, Ghosts of the Amistad, directed by Tony Buba. He is currently writing a book about escaping slavery by sea in Atlantic antebellum America, and his play, The Return of Benjamin Lay, which was co-written with Naomi Wallace, will premiere in London in June of 2023. Marcus, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you, Tammy. I, I've known uh, you, Tammy, for uh, about 10 years now. Uh, and I want to say to all the people who are listening that you are really lucky to have Tammy uh, working on the public uh, history of Connecticut. I have the highest regard for her. It's good to be with you again, Tammy. Um, I'd also like to, to say one more thing. Uh, I in writing this book, uh, The Amistad Rebellion, have given a lot of talks uh, in various places, really throughout Connecticut uh, over the years. And I must say, it, it is really heartwarming to me to see how much this story means to the people of Connecticut. Uh, it, it's really an extraordinary thing. It, it really is very important to the, the state's sense of its own identity and uh, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be uh, speaking to people in Connecticut uh, once again. Uh, I want to talk with you today about um, a book I wrote uh, and a film I made. Uh, the, the book is The Amistad Rebellion, An Atlantic Odyssey of Slavery and Freedom. This was published in uh, 2012 by Viking Penguin. Uh, and as a spinoff of that in 2013, I made this film, I was the producer of this film called Ghosts of Amistad in the Footsteps of the Rebels. And for this film, Tony Buba, the director, and I went uh, with a film crew to Sierra Leone. This is where all of the Amistad Africans had come from. And we went from, uh, we went to 10 villages that I had discovered in my research were places that the Amistad Africans came from. And we interviewed elders. 
And we also searched for Lomboko, the place where uh, the Amistad Africans were incarcerated on the coast of Sierra Leone before they were shipped through the Middle Passage uh, to Havana, Cuba, where they were then loaded onto a vessel called the Amistad. Uh, and uh, the rest is history. I'll go into the details of that history in just a minute. But uh, what I want to say is that uh, I have been working and thinking on the Amistad Rebellion for quite a few years now. Um, let me just tell you how I came to write about it. The book that Tammy mentioned uh, called The Slave Ship, A Human History, this is the book that I wrote before the Amistad Rebellion. And that uh, folks, was a really grueling and difficult book to write because of the, the horrors on board the uh, slave ship. And um, in the course of doing that research, I, I studied, uh, I would estimate, uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of rebellions, and almost all of them failed. So in the back of my mind, as I see these, you know, one failure after another, I'm asking myself, how did the Amistad rebels manage to succeed? How did they actually do it? How did they manage to win their freedom when so few others were, actually, were ever able to do that? So one of the things I did was to go back and, and read all of the published scholarship in the Amistad, and there's quite a lot of it. And what I discovered was that uh, almost everyone spent about two minutes or two pages on the, um, on the actual uprising, the mutiny, the, the, uh, the moment when the Amistad Africans captured the ship. And then they would spend 200 pages on the court case. And I thought this was wrong. Uh, I thought that the rebellion itself needed to have pride of place in this story. So this is one of the things that, that encouraged me to go on and do this work and to really try to make uh, the uprising itself uh, the centerpiece of the story and thereby to put the Amistad Africans back at the center of their own freedom struggle. So this is what I tried to do uh, in the book. Uh, this is what uh, we continued in the film. And so, uh, so let me elaborate on that and, and tell you basically how that interpretation works. Uh, I want to begin by giving an overview of what happened in the Amistad Rebellion. Um, many people may not have it fresh in mind. Uh, some of you might have the wrong idea by having watched Steven Spielberg's film uh, Amistad. So let's just talk about uh, when it happened, where it happened, how it happened, uh, and, and sort of fill in a background against which I can then uh, speak for the remainder of the lecture. Uh, I'm sure that all of you realize that the Amistad Rebellion did not begin in Connecticut. Uh, it actually began in Sierra Leone, and it had a very specific origin in Sierra Leone. Uh, what will become the Amistad Rebellion has its origin in a series of wars over the slave trade. Now, the key players in this are, first of all, a Cuban, a white Cuban slave trader by the name of Pedro Blanco. Uh, that was actually his name, Pedro Blanco, a slave trader. You can't make these things up. Um, and he actually took up residence in uh, southern Sierra Leone and developed an alliance with a local king. Uh, King Shaka of the Vai people, V-A-I. They were a uh, smaller but quite powerful coastal kingdom in southern Sierra Leone. And what happened basically in this alliance was that Pedro Blanco gave uh, King Shaka guns, uh, European style weapons. Uh, he taught him how to use them. He trained his soldiers and then his soldiers would use this firepower to go out into the countryside uh, and capture other people. If we could have the next slide, please. Okay, this is a, this is a map of uh, of Sierra Leone, and I don't, can you? We're looking at this area in the south, right around here. Uh, you can see Lomboko. That's the uh, slave trading factory where the Amistad Africans were held. Uh, the Vi were in the coastal kingdom. You can see their name here. 
but most of their attacks were against people in the interior, especially the Mende people. This was the largest, and I think still is the largest ethnic group in, uh, in Sierra Leone. Uh, most of the people on board the Amistad were of Mende background, although uh, there were also people who were uh, Kono, who were Temne, uh, several different groups. In fact, they're on the Amistad, of 53 people, 49 men and four children, three little girls and a little boy, of that 53 people, we had about nine or 10 different ethnic groups. So that tells you how deeply into the interior uh, King Shaka's armies ranged. Uh, and and this, is, uh, this is the origin of the story. Now, very crucial to know that since these raiding parties were very common, from King Shaka's army, one of the things that the interior villages did was both to fortify themselves and to train people to fight. And one of the things that you will see is very important to the Amistad story is that you had a bunch of trained warriors on that vessel. These were people who had been fighting against King Shaka's army. We know that Sinke, the leader of the rebellion, had fought specifically against King Shaka's army. Um, so they're not just a random collection of people on board this vessel. They're people who are trained in the way of war. They are, uh, several of them, war captives. And, and this is really very important. So in the 1830s, these wars over the slave trade are going on in Sierra Leone. Uh, many thousands of people are taken to the coastal slave trading factory called Lamboco. I might mention that the slave trade at this point in time is illegal. Great Britain abolished the slave trade in 1807. And then in the 1830s made treaties with both Spain and Portugal, uh, who agreed that they also would no longer carry on the slave trade. But the demand for labor especially in Brazil and Cuba uh, in the uh, 1820s and 1830s, and actually well into the 1860s, the demand for labor was so great that the slave trade went on illegally. And that's what was happening in Sierra Leone. This was an illegal slave trading operation. And that's very important. So what happened to the Amistad Africans, they are, they are basically funneled from the interior toward the coast, uh, to Lomboco. They're incarcerated there. They are loaded onto a Portuguese or perhaps Brazilian slave ship called the Tesoura. Uh, they, they, they sail the Middle Passage. There is actually an uprising on board the Tesoura during the Middle Passage. Uh, they arrive in Cuba. Uh, and in Cuba, they are people are sold uh, and a group, a subset of the people on board the Tesoro are, are purchased by uh, a Cuban man named Ruiz, and several of the others are purchased by another Cuban man named Montes, and they are then placed on board the Amistad, this, this small schooner. You're going to have the next slide. Here's a, a painting of the Amistad by uh, an abolitionist artist. Uh, and they are going to go on a voyage from Havana to a place that's not very far away. It's really only a couple of days away, maybe three days away by sail. Uh, it's a, it was a plantation region, a sugar plantation region, a nascent uh, such region. So the Amistad Africans were going there to cut sugar cane, which is one of the most violent and brutal uh, uh, regimes to be found anywhere in the Atlantic slave system. They're on their way to the sugar region. Now, on the voyage itself, they run into contrary winds, uh, and the, the discontent seems to be rising. And then a kind of fateful thing happens. There is a, a slave sailor who is owned by the ship captain, Ramon Ferrer, who begins to taunt Cinque. And he does this uh, in a very provocative way. He, he basically says through sign language uh, that you, Cinque, are going to be taken to a place where you will be eaten alive by the white people. And he did this by, by signs where he you know, would cut his neck and then 
eaten alive, things like this. Well, um, this uh, slave sailor named Celestino was really messing with the wrong person because Cinque was a, a fierce and well-trained fighter. Uh, and by the way, uh, a number of people of West Africa did believe that the Europeans were cannibals. This is kind of ironic because uh, cannibalism was a charge levied by the Europeans against Africans to justify their enslavement. They, the Africans were not uh, cannibals uh, in any way. But in a very interesting and important way, the Europeans were cannibals in this sense. If you were captured and taken to a sugar plantation, you would be consumed alive by that work. In other words, it would, it would basically take your life force away. People died very young. So uh, the plantation system itself cannibalized people. Uh, so anyway, that evening, Cinque meets in the hold of the vessel with his fellow warriors. They hold a meeting and they uh, basically hold a debate. Uh, is it time to rise up and capture this ship? Uh, I hypothesized in the book that this was a meeting of the Poro Society. That is an all-male secret society uh, throughout Sierra Leone. All of the different ethnic groups have Poro societies. And Poro societies basically govern village life. But most importantly, in this instance, the Poro members decide when they are going to go to war. And they decided, after a pretty significant debate, they decided to go to war to capture the vessel. Now, one of the reasons why they were successful is that the three little girls on board the ship played a very important role in this uprising. Uh, children were not uh, cuffed or manacled like the, the men, the enslaved men. So they had the free range of the ship. It's always been a bit of a, a mystery as to how the Amistad Africans uh, found out that there were machetes or cane knives on board the ship. Well, this is one of those great moments of research. Um, I found out that it was the little girls who found the cane knives and informed the men of this. Uh, so they, they broke out from the lower deck in the middle of the night and a furious uprising took place. The first person killed was Celestino, the sailor who had taunted Cinque. The captain of the vessel, Ramon Ferrer, was killed. Uh, one of the Amistad Africans was uh, severely wounded and died later. The whole thing went on only for a few minutes. And very rapidly, the Amistad Africans had captured the vessel. So the question now is what to do with it? Uh, they didn't know how to sail it. So what Cinque said, he, he went to one of the, the, the Span, Spanish or Cuban enslavers, this man named Montes, who had been a ship captain, and he instructed him to sail toward the rising sun, which would be eastward back towards Sierra Leone. Um, and because the sun had been, the rising sun had been at their back on the middle passage. So he had an idea of what direction to go. Uh, but Montez, being a, a sort of deceptive fellow himself, uh, played a trick on Cinque and the others in that he would sail toward the rising sun during the daylight hours, but he would keep the sails of the vessel loose and flapping in the wind so they didn't make too much progress. And then at night, he would reverse course and sail back towards Cuba and North America, hoping that another vessel would intercept them and uh, capture them and save his life, along with uh, that of Ruiz, the other uh, enslaver. So what happens, uh, to, to make a long story short, is that this extraordinary freedom voyage goes on from the north coast of Cuba all the way up to the northern end of Long Island, New York. It's about 1,600 miles. Uh, and it turns out that some of these African men knew something about sailing. Um, I have some theories about how that could have happened, and we can go into that if you like. But anyway, they made this successful uh, voyage. Uh, I once uh, met the skipper of the Amistad replica vessel 
which was uh, built, I think, in 2005, a, a very knowledgeable seafaring man named Sean Burkaw, working out of Mystic Seaport. And I told him some of the findings that I had, had uh, discovered in the course of my research. On the way from Cuba up the North American coast, in the trade winds, by the way, with the trade winds assisting them, the Amistad Africans uh, stopped and anchored 30 times uh, to get water and to try to get food. They didn't have enough food. Uh, Sean, the, the very knowledgeable master of these tall ships, was astonished that they had actually managed to stop that many times. And that's because that bespeaks a certain level of maritime skill. Anyway, they made it to the northern end of Long Island, and that's actually what's depicted in this painting. You can see the boat with several Amistad Africans in it. There's one on the shore. That's Cinque. They've, they've discovered a group of white hunters uh, on northern Long Island. This is called Culloden's Point, not far from Montauk. And Cinque is giving one of these hunters a gun in an act of friendship. And what the Amistad Africans want is for these people to help them get back to Sierra Leone. But you can see in the background of this painting, there is a naval vessel that is the U.S. brig Washington that is uh, about to arrive on the scene to take the Amistad in tow, to imprison all of the Amistad Africans, and to carry them to New London, Connecticut, where they will be thrown in jail. They'll eventually be, used, be moved to New Haven, uh, where they will spend most of their time uh, awaiting trial. Uh, their case will move through uh, an extraordinary legal process. Um, in the jail, in the New Haven jail, local abolitionists get, uh, get wind of what's happened. And they uh, come into the jail and, and really uh, an alliance develops between the, the African rebels who carried the ship, captured the ship on the one hand, and the mostly white, mostly middle-class abolitionists who now see a great opportunity to publicize their cause. So what happens inside the jail is really fascinating. There's like a, a mutual education process going on where the, uh, the abolitionists are helping to educate the Africans, especially in the ways of Christianity. And the Amistad Africans recognize that this is very important to their new allies. So they're willing to study the Bible. They take English lessons. Uh, they study uh, arithmetic. Uh, you know, the, the, the jail became a school actually. But it's also true that the Amistad rebels are educating the, uh, the abolitionists. Uh, they're educating them about this uprising. They're educating them about their political will to be free. And in doing that, they develop a very interesting way of talking about themselves, the Amistad rebels. They call themselves the Mende people. Now, they weren't all Mende, but Mende was a dominant language in the region, and a majority of the people were Mende. And I, the reason why I think they started calling themselves the Mende people, they had been around a political discourse uh, while they were in jail that talked about the American people. The American people were the sovereign people. This is the way things work in a republic. So they wanted to make their own claims as the Mende people. And they did that. They actually instructed John Quincy Adams what he was supposed to say in his defense of them before the Supreme Court. So uh, the case makes its way through the court system. And surprisingly, I mean, to everybody's astonishment, certainly uh, to the shock of all of the abolitionists, the uh, Amistad rebels win their case. They win it uh, in federal court and they win it before the Supreme Court. They, they win it on a technicality in, in a very real sense, because the, the, the judges are very keen to limit the, uh, the applicability of this victory so that all of these enslaved people in America don't think that they might be free too. Of course, it's very hard to control that. So they ruled on very narrow grounds that these people had been illegally enslaved uh, in Cuba, that they, uh, because Cuba, as part of Spain at that time, had signed a treaty 
saying that they would not engage in the slave trade. Uh, and when it became clear in the courtroom that none of the Amistad Africans understood any Spanish, it was very clear that they hadn't been living in Cuba for the number of years before the signing of that treaty. Uh, and so uh, both the federal judges and the Supreme Court judges ruled uh, in this narrow technical way that they were entitled to their freedom because they had been illegally enslaved. Okay, so, uh, but that's not the end of the story by any means because the Amistad Africans and the abolitionists have now got to figure out how to get back to Sierra Leone. This is what they want to do. There are 35 of them who have survived this whole ordeal. Um, uh, about a dozen or more died soon after the original voyage uh, of hunger or disease. A few others died in the first couple of weeks that they had come ashore. There were now 35, and their idea of freedom was to go home to Sierra Leone. This is what they wanted. They wanted to go home. They never wavered in that, uh, in that request. But the Supreme Court ruling didn't provide them with any resources that they could use to go home. So what do they do? The uh, abolitionists organize a speaking tour and they go up and down the East Coast in all of the northern states. Uh, they frequently would speak in black churches, and they ask people to come and pay admission uh, and, and also to support their, their return to Sierra Leone. They raised a tremendous amount of money. Uh, they would do things like uh, sing Christian hymns. Uh, Sinke was always the star of these shows. He would deliver his account of the uprising, and he would do it in Mende, which is really, he insisted on speaking his own language, but apparently he was a, a, a riveting speaker, no matter what language he was speaking. Uh, so, so the Amistad Africans uh, raised a tremendous amount of money. Uh, for the longest time, it was assumed that they were sent back to Africa by a wealthy abolitionist named Louis Tappan. It turns out that that's not true. They raised their own money to, to go home, uh, and they do return to Sierra Leone in January 1842 uh, to a great homecoming. And uh, this is really an extraordinary victory for the anti-slavery movement. Now, I want to just pause and emphasize, folks, this is a story about self-emancipation. These Amistad Africans rose up, captured this ship, sailed it to freedom, then got jailed, built an alliance with the uh, abolitionists, and finally won their court case to the surprise of everyone. But they, they needed help, but they really did liberate themselves. And I think this is, this is a key part of the story. Uh, and that's, of course, one reason why they were able to be repatriated uh, back to Sierra Leone. So that's, that's the story in miniature. Let me talk to you now a little bit about how the Amistad uh, history has been interpreted by historians. Uh, the first interpreter that I want to mention is uh, Steven Spielberg. And I will tell you straight away that one of my reasons for writing this book was to oppose his interpretation of how this whole thing happened. Uh, the, the Africans in that story are kind of uh, what I would call noble savages. They seem to exist outside of history and culture. Uh, they, th their backgrounds, their military skills are really not uh, considered to be significant. And the main players are John Quincy Adams and the, the white attorneys and the, uh, the judges and all the rest. So it's not uh, far-fetched to say that, that this is kind of a white savior narrative. Uh, in, in my view, that is, is all, all wrong. Um, that movie was to some extent based on a very good legal history of the Amistad Rebellion. It's called uh, Mutiny on the Amistad by Howard Jones, uh, published in 1987. Uh, still a very good and very useful book. But, but again, as I suggested earlier, concentrated too much on the legal story and not on the social story, not on the African background. 
so this is this is what I wanted to to emphasize. Uh, I might mention there's been uh, some very good uh, recent scholarship on the uh, on the Amistad case. Um, Arthur Abraham, who is featured in our film, uh, the leading the late leading scholar of the Mende people, wrote a really influential pamphlet uh, about the Amistad Rising and its Sierra Leonean connections. Uh, We've had Sierra Leonean scholars like Ionolu Usagi, who has talked about the uh, images of the Amistad Rebellion in both literature and film. Uh, and since then, we've also had a, a major contribution by a German scholar, Michael Zoiska, who discovered a large cache of documents in Cuba. So he filled in a lot of information about the um, Ramon Ferrer, the owner of the Amistad, and, and that side of the story. Um, a historian named Benjamin Lawrence has written a very good book about the Amistad children, uh, Amistad's orphans, the title of that. Uh, and then finally, there's a new book that will be coming out very soon by a, a terrific young scholar named Joseph Yanelli. And what he's done is study the Amistad Africans after they arrived back in Sierra Leone, where something called the Mende Mission was built. And, and Joe's argument is really fascinating. He basically says that the Mende Mission was an extension of the Underground Railroad which was, uh, which was basically used to try to undermine uh, slavery as it existed in Sierra Leone and, and thereby to disrupt uh, the slave trade. So, so that's basically the historiography. Uh, my approach, if we could have the next slide, please. My approach is uh, to emphasize history from below. Uh, this is basically the history of the people who are usually left out of the top-down narratives of the past. We have here an image of an uprising on a Spanish slave ship from the, probably the early 1790s. This gives you an image of how it looked. You can see that the crew has retreated behind a defensive bulwark. They're firing down at the enslaved who have managed to get out of their chains. Uh, this kind of history uh, this history from below is, it's a tradition of historical writing. Uh, it's been going on since the, well, for a long time, but especially since the 60s and 70s, when different movements, civil rights, black power, the anti-war movement, the women's movement began to demand new kinds of history that took seriously a broader uh, participation of the people who lived in America. So, so I wanted to, as I've said, recenter the African rebels. If we could have the, the next slide, please. These are two people that you've seen in Spielberg's film. Uh, most everyone knows that John Quincy Adams was the legal representative of the Amasad Africans before the Supreme Court. And here is Cinque, uh, as painted by uh, an abolitionist painter named Nathaniel Jocelyn. And I, thought, I think it's a really fascinating painting because it depicts Cinque in a state of freedom in Africa. In other words, the painting tries to, to both look at the past, imagine who Cinque or Singbe, that was his Mende name, who he was in the past and who he will be in the future. Uh, and that is a free man in his own uh, uh, country. Um, my approach was to try to understand everybody else, uh, the, all the other Amistad Africans, the uh, 52 others. Uh, but I will admit that, you know, when I went into this story, I, I kind of thought that uh, John Quincy Adams had gotten too much attention in all this. Well, it turns out I, my respect for John Quincy Adams was renewed because he not only represented the Amistad Africans, he visited them in jail. Uh, he wanted to meet them. He wanted to talk with them. And when he got out of that jail, he wrote the leading abolitionist and complained about the living conditions, saying these people needed warmer clothes and better shoes. So, so he was really a, a very important part of all this. And of course, Cinque, uh, no matter how much history from below I wanted to do, there's no denying that he was the leader of this revolt and the leader uh, 
every moment afterwards. Whenever in jail, someone would ask the Amistad Africans, this or that, they'd say, let us talk to Sinke. Let us talk to Sinke. Sinke is our leader. Uh, one man said, Sinke is the president of the poor, uh, which is kind of a fascinating way of putting it. But this history from below uh, does take into account uh, a much larger number of the Amistad rebels. And if we could have the next slide, please. Now, these are two of the most important figures. These are taken, of course, from the drawings that are in the Beinecke Library at Yale University. There are 22 of them. Um, they're, they're really powerfully done. They're done by an 18-year-old artist who was in the courtroom. He, wrote, he, he drew these very intimate uh, portraits. Um, the, the one on the left is a man who in English was called Grabo. Very important figure. Uh, Sinke was a military leader of the Amistad Africans, but Grabo was a spiritual leader. And by that I mean he was a very highly ranking man in the Poro society. And it was easy to tell this about him because he had many ritual tattoos and, or scarifications. So the Amistad Africans could take one look at Grabo uh, and see that he was a person of great power. So he was, he was crucial. Uh, it was Grabo's village called Folu, where we found in the film some very interesting uh, connections. We actually found uh, a woman elder who was a direct descendant of Grabo. Uh, so that was a very meaningful part of our film. And then the other figure, and I think Tammy could probably tell you more about her than I can, is Margu. This is one of the little girls. She was about nine or 10 years old. She's one of the ones who found the cane knives and allowed the rebellion to take place. Uh, she was the first black female graduate of Oberlin College, and she went on to become a missionary uh, at the Mende Mission. Uh, very important uh, figure. And if we can have the next slide, please. Now, one of the things about... Being in jail in New Haven, you must understand jails were very different in the 19th century than they are today in the sense that the jailer uh, wanted to make money off of the people who were in the jail. If that meant selling them food or whatever it might be, uh, the jailer wanted to make money. And when it became clear that literally thousands of people in Connecticut wanted to go in that jail and see and maybe even converse with the Amistad Africans, uh, the jailer started charging admission. And the abolitionists are furious about this, but there's really nothing that they can do about it. So lots of people come through, including several artists. And one of these is a man named John Warner Barber, who uh, was an engraver an artisan in New Haven, and he created a pamphlet about the history of the Amistad captives. And he drew this, he engraved this image showing four of the Amistad Africans holding those cane knives, killing Captain Ferrer. It's called the death of Captain Ferrer, the captain of the Amistad, July 1839. What's especially fascinating about this is that uh, you can tell who some of these people are, some of these individuals are. Uh, the leftmost figure is uh, Sinke, and we can tell who various other people are. This is detailed in the book. But one of the points is that people who went into the jail ended up doing important things to publicize the case and build a movement around the whole thing. So, so, so this is actually uh, uh, quite important. Okay, so the, the next image. I've already mentioned that you know my uh, interpretation of this event depends to a great deal uh, depends a great deal on the knowledge that the Amistad Africans were trained warriors back in their homeland. What you see in the image on the left is a Temne warrior, uh, whose preferred weapon was a bow and arrow. The arrows are uh, doctored with poison, and on the right you see an image. Uh, of Sinke posed uh, really as a Roman hero with uh, his machete or cane knife. But here's what's really fascinating about this. It turns out that the preferred weapon of Mende warriors 
was the cutlass, something very similar to a cane knife. So you can only imagine how Cinque and the other Mende warriors felt when these three little girls tell them the location about these cane knives. They think this is a, this is a sign from the heavens that we are meant to be free. Uh, and by the way, one thing about this image on the right of Cinque, when I first saw it, I couldn't quite imagine who would create an image that so glorified this violent uprising. I thought to myself, is there some a uh, really militant abolitionist group that I don't know about. It turns out this image was drawn by an artist for a penny press newspaper, the New York Sun, with the explicit goal of selling newspapers and sell them it did. They ran out of these images immediately, had to reprint again and again. But again, this is kind of a, an Americanized version, dressed as a sailor, by the way. He's got on sailor's pants, baggy pants, and a sort of a buccaneer's frock. This is an Americanized vision uh, of, of an African warrior. Okay, uh, next image, please. Okay, so let me talk to you a little bit about the film that we made. Uh, I won't go on long about this. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to see it. This is a street scene, and you can see this is a, a group of Sierra Leonean heroes. Uh, Cinque is right here. Uh, next, next image, please. We went to Freetown, which is the capital of Sierra Leone. And from there, we went out into the countryside. Next image. This is the filmmaker, Tony Buba, along with our colleague, uh, uh, Sierra Leonean videographer, Idris Kapanga, who quite tragically passed away about a year ago. Uh, next image, please. Here I am meeting with one of the local chiefs uh, and his grandson. And, and basically this was our strategy. We went to these 10 villages. Uh, we asked to speak with male and female elders. We asked a series of questions and ultimately we hoped to find out if there was any memory of the Amistad case in the oral tradition. In some villages, there was none. In two or three villages, there was a little bit, but in two villages, there was a lot of memory. Next image, please. Another part of our quest was to find Lomboko, the place where the uh, Amistad Africans had been uh, held before they were uh, carried across the Atlantic on the Middle Passage. Nobody seemed to know where it was. We asked person after person after person, and they said, oh, it's underwater now. Oh, it's gone to bush. Oh, you'll never find it. But we finally found a man who told us, he said, I don't know exactly where uh, Lomboko is, but I know the people who will know. So he got in the car with us and took us to a tiny village on the coast called Toko. Uh, and we asked them, do you know where's Lomboko? They say, sure, we fish there all the time. You want to go? And so here are the Toko fishermen getting ready to put us in their canoes to take us to Lomboko. Next image, please. And here we are going through the mangrove swamp. Uh, we found uh, Lomboko. There's no doubt in my mind that that was the place. The Toko uh, elder that we talked to, Vandy Massaquoi, knew a lot about the history. It was sort of shocking how much he knew about the history. A uh, very credible uh, uh, person who had had numerous stories about this passed down to him. So, so just to wrap up, What's the legacy, what's the meaning of the Amistad Rebellion for the modern world? Uh, I think it's really crucial that this is a story of people who fought back. I mean, the remarkable thing about the story of the slave ship uh, that I wrote is that people never accepted the reality of that enslavement. They fought back in every conceivable way. Uh, the slave, uh, the, the, the response of the enslaved employed every conceivable kind of resistance. Uh, the slave trade was in many ways like a 400 year hunger strike. Insurrections, even though they failed, people kept fighting. Some people jumped overboard knowing perfectly well they were going to be eaten alive by sharks. 
So resistance matters and successful resistance, such as we had with the Amistad, that really matters. And you know how you can tell? One of the things that's really extraordinary about the Amistad case is that this group of 53 uh, men and children, there actually were no women on board of the Amistad, this group, small group of people on a tiny vessel on the north coast of Cuba, captured that ship and then captured the attention of the most powerful people in the world the President of the United States, the U.S. Congress, the Supreme Court justices, the Queens of England and Spain, the British Parliament are all debating what these people did and what was the meaning of it. And this is one of the really surprising things about history from below. You never know when it will arise and you never know what an extraordinary thing uh, it can accomplish. And so this, I think, is the, the most important thing about the Amistad Rebellion. It shows how people could fight for their freedom and they could win. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Marcus. This was wonderful. And thank you for that warm and kind endorsement. Really appreciate it. Your check is in the mail. <laughs> no, but thank you very much. Uh, we do have some questions. Uh, one question is, how did the courts, well, before we start here, if um, you have not placed your question, please put it in the chat box on whatever platform you're watching so that we can ask those questions. Please remember to take our survey and thank you again for joining us today. Uh, so one of the questions is, how did the courts deal with the Spanish government's claim for the enslaved as property? Well, the, the court took that very seriously. And one of the reasons why the court took it seriously is because that claim was supported by the United States government. Uh, you know, one thing that people need to know is that the Amistad Africans and this small bunch of despised abolitionists, and, and believe me, in 1839, abolitionists were quite despised. They achieved all this while taking on two of the most powerful governments in the world. The U.S. government wanted to send the Amistad Africans back to Cuba as slaves as quickly as possible. That's partly because uh, the, the American political system was at that time uh, quite seriously dominated by Southern slave owners who, who are basically telling, uh, you know, Martin Van Buren and others, send these people back to Cuba. So what happened was the judges ended up ruling against those claims when it was discovered that the Amistad Africans had been illegally enslaved. Now, one kind of fascinating thing that might have been uh, Pedro Montes, the uh, Spanish enslaver who was the ship captain, tried to take the Amistad Africans into Charleston, South Carolina. But they sort of figured out this wasn't what they wanted to do. I'm not sure exactly how, but they kept going up the coast. Can you imagine what the outcome of this would have been if they had been uh, taken in South Carolina and not in Connecticut? They would have been on the first boat back to Cuba. So, so this is a, actually a very important thing that they managed to keep sailing the vote, the, the, the Amistad until they got to a place where freedom was a possibility. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, was there any security available for the enslaved after they were captured? Uh, security? Um, n well, no. I mean, they were, they were jailed. Uh, they were not particularly well treated by the jail authorities, but uh, they had some powerful allies in these abolitionists who would bring food in, who could do things to you know, make their conditions much better. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, enslaved people anywhere are never going to be treated very well by the authorities. Uh, but in this case, the, the importance of the allies really did matter. Uh, and... Uh, it's also really significant, and, and this is something that I, I think is, was never stressed enough. The people of New Haven really the, rallied to the cause of the Amistad Africans. Uh, and, and here's how you know that. There, it was feared, uh, it was feared by the abolitionists that the Supreme Court was going to rule against the Amistad Africans and that they were going to be very suddenly taken out of jail, put on a ship, and then sent to Cuba. They were very worried about this because they didn't expect the Supreme Court to rule in their favor. 
the, the, the abolitionists said to the Amistad Africans, if ever that should happen and you feel like you're being removed from the jail of the middle of the night, make a ruckus, make a lot of sound, scream, holler, and people will come to defend you. They believed that the townspeople of New Haven would defend them, and I think they were right. I think they would have defended them. So this is a statement about the way in which this was not just a legal case, but in many ways a social movement. Uh, we have a descendant of Nathaniel Jocelyn, and he wants to know, what do you find interesting about the portrait of Sinke? Or they would like to know what you find interesting about the portrait of Sinke. Yes, great uh, uh, question, uh, and very happy to entertain it from a descendant of Nathaniel Jocelyn. You have a very distinguished uh, ancestor who was really, by the way, quite radical. In other words, uh, Nathaniel Jocelyn wasn't one of these polite abolitionists who didn't believe in taking action. He uh, was apparently quite willing to rescue the Amistad Africans and help them escape if the Supreme Court ruling went against them. So I think that's a very important thing about your ancestor. Uh, what I really love about um, this image is that, and I've written about this in the book, if you'd like to, if you'd like to know more, it basically uh, depicts uh, Sinke as the Moses of his people. You know, the staff, the dressing, uh, it, it sort of evokes kind of classic Christian uh, uh, elements and especially the uh, escape from Egypt. So I think there's a, there's a fascinating way in which uh, Nathaniel Jocelyn combined certain elements of Sierra Leonean culture with certain elements of Christian culture to maximize the impact of the painting and to develop uh, sympathy. Uh, you know, this is a political painting. Right. This had this painting had a very clear political purpose, and that was to build support for the the Amistad Africans and their freedom uh, and, and also to build support for the anti-slavery movement. And, and I do think it was uh, very effective in that regard. Uh, there's another story in uh, the book that that might interest you. Uh, this painting was commissioned by a black abolitionist named Robert Purvis who had the painting in his study when uh, a man came through the Underground Railroad, a man named Madison Washington, uh, was on his way to Canada. And he says uh, to Purvis, who's that? And Purvis tells him that this is, he tells him the story of Cinque and the Amistad. And it turns out Madison Washington uh, came back to the South to try to uh, liberate his wife and children, and he was captured. And when he was shipped from Virginia, literally by ship, uh, on the way to New Orleans, he uh, led an uprising, just like the one on the Amistad, uh, that resulted uh, in a, uh, the freedom of a lot of the people on board this slave ship called the Creole. Uh, and uh, I think it's fascinating that the painting was so powerful that it actually helped to inspire a second uprising on board a slave ship. Thank you. I love that portrait as well. I love how it shows the warrior side of him as well. Even though it was mm -hmm. a political picture, it still shows that he had that warrior spirit and that he was a warrior and he was a fighter. And it has that sense of self-worth of, I know Definitely. who I am, I want my freedom and I will fight to get it. So I love that about him. Uh, powerful, have, powerful expression of dignity. Yes, yes, very much so. We have a question from Andre on Facebook. Um, he wants to know, should we not be referring to him as Singbe P.A. as Singke was his enslaved name? Yeah, this is a good question. And, and I have uh, given this a lot of thought. Uh, we probably should call him Singbe. Uh, actually, I'm not myself convinced that P.A. was actually his last name. I think that's a, a, a later invention. But his, his first name was definitely Singbe. But here's, here's the catch. Now, I did call him Singke in my book, and here's the reason why. There are numerous documents that I found in the course of my research, uh, letters, for example, in which he signs his name Singke. 
So this definitely is a name that he accepted. Uh, and I think it's important. He, the, in a sense, this was his movement name. Uh, his name, he was known in America as Cinque. He recognized that. Uh, he thought there was power in that, so he accepted that. But as far as I know, when he went back to Sierra Leone, he reverted back to his uh, Mende name, which is Singbe. I like that. And you know what? I think it speaks to how he had to, of his ingenuity, of how that name, they knew him in this country by that name and to get the power or the support that he needed for whatever he right. needed, he would refer to himself as that. But I do also appreciate the fact that because in history, a lot of the enslaved people's given right. name were removed, I do appreciate using his given name that was that he remembered and that he let to be made known. But I like that other point of view as well. Thank you. Uh, we have Alex on YouTube. Um, they state that they're not surprised by Steven Spielberg's interpretation, but would be interested in why you think his interpretation was the way it was. Well, I, I think this film was made in, in good faith. Uh, some of you may know uh, Steven Spielberg has two African-American children. Uh, he wanted uh, to make this story, I think, in many ways for them. But I think it was kind of a, a, a there was a certain limit to his imagination. And, and that's partly a political limit. And here I can tell you a story from the very distinguished Mende scholar, Arthur Abraham, who was, a, uh, who was on the set. He was the historical consultant for, for the Amistad. And uh, Arthur told me, he said, <laughs> you know, they wouldn't listen to a word I said. There was, there was one instance in the jail where the Temne people and the Mende people are, are fighting over a boundary. And, uh, and Arthur told uh, Spielberg that would never have happened. But, you know, Spielberg thinks that he's serving a higher calling, which is entertainment. Uh, it's not necessary that entertainers get all the facts right. But I think it is important to show uh, the, the real humanity of the people who managed to rise up and capture that slave ship. And uh, this is what uh, I've tried to do in my book. I always tell people when I do the performance of Sarah Magu that Steven Spielberg's movie is Hollywood, that you have to do your research, you have to read it. But I do appreciate the effort that he made, but I also appreciate how he came about the story, which was Miss Debbie Allen. And a lot of people right. do not realize that it took her 13 years to get people to pay attention to her. And all because of that particular effort is why we started to have the resurgence right. and the remembrance of the Amistad captives. Um, and, another one, more, one more thing, Tammy. It, there is one thing that's really, uh, I was going to say groundbreaking, but I don't want to use a landed metaphor. The images of the uprising on board the Amistad in Spielberg's film are very powerful to be, to show people in revolt like that. I, I think that was a, a very powerful part of the film. And I think he deserves credit for that. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, let, there's one more. It says um, there was saddened by Fune's death prior to the opportunity to go home. Um, she said, I imagine his wife in Sierra Leone must have been heartbroken. Are there details of Fune's experience and that of his family? You know, this was a tragic thing, and there was actually debate about whether Fune died in an accident or was actually a suicide. Um, the abolitionists who were closest to him tended to think that it was a suicide, that he had grown despondent about whether they were ever going to be able to go home or not. And so when we went in Sierra Leone to the village um, that where Fune had lived, uh, we, I'm talking with my colleague Tazif Karoma, who is our translator and our cultural guide. Uh, and, and I said to him in an aside, I said, can we tell the people here that Fune may have committed suicide? And his answer was really interesting. He said, no, we can't say that because he said that would be a matter of shame for the whole village. And if you told them that they wouldn't talk about uh, the case. Now, it turns out they didn't know a lot about Fune. They did know the meaning of his name, which meant someone who was very strong, someone who, who, who could be a great fighter. Uh, and they did in this village have some serious criticisms of King Shaka. So there was some memory there, 
but uh, we were not able to find out uh, much of anything about uh, him or his family. The, the memory there was quite limited. I was um, speaking with um, someone who actually does a tour in Farmington where he's actually buried. And it was another scenario was thought because of the description of how he died, that he possibly had an aneurysm because of the way he froze up in the water. So we don't really know. And I, I would like to think that he stuck with the meaning of his name, that he was, he was strong, but right. you know, we have no way of really knowing. And that's, the, know. that's the, that's the part of history where sometimes we have to guess and come up with conjecture. But I like to look at the hum human side of the individuals who were uh, removed from what was most familiar to them, brought to a foreign place. Right. And like you said, they use everything that they had from their from their inner being, from where they were from, to fight for what was rightfully theirs. So thank you so much, Marcus. I really appreciate you being here. It was really great to see you. And thank you so very much for being on Conversations at Noon today. Greatly appreciate it. Thank all of you for joining us today. Um, again, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to um, put them in our survey. Let us know what we can um, talk about, what you are most interested in. Let us know how we're doing, how we can improve. We greatly appreciate the feedback. Um, next month, our conversation at noon will feature Miss Paula Agnew from um, the um, Discovering Amistad. She is the executive director. On April 25th is where she will be, is when she will join us. Um, it's Lessons of the Amistad, which will be the other part of our trilogy. Conversations at noon will be the Lessons of the Amistad through the lens of an African-centered woman with Paula Mann Agnew. Saturday, April 29th, we will have the encounters. And then Tuesday, May 9th, we will get to see the third part of the trilogy that was postponed in February, where we will be with um, Charles Warner Jr., the chairman of the Connecticut Freedom Trail, Ms. Adrian Joy Burns, and myself. So please join us again. Put us on your calendar. We really appreciate the support. And until the next time.